Hey, good evening. My name is Jim Lane. I am the chair of the Reconciling Next team here at Washington Street and have been a member here at Washington Street for a little over 20 years now. I've been involved in the work of this church to become, um, to take a strong stand for full inclusion since 2005 when I first learned about the Reconciling Ministries Network and brought some of that information back to Washington Street. In 2007, we celebrated our first Reconciling um, co Community here at Washington Street, the Grace Sunday School class. And then in the years following that, multiple other communities, circles, other Sunday School classes, active faith groups, and, and so on and so forth, also became Reconciling um, Communities. In 2019, we celebrated um, becoming a Reconciling Congregation, um, only the second Reconciling Congregation um, in South Carolina right now. So we're very pleased about that step. Simultaneously to the vote to become a Reconciling Congregation, the Reconciling Next team began a two-fold charge from our church council. One, to provide educational opportunities related to sexual orientation and gender identity for our congregation. And two, to build ministries of compassion and justice with members of the LGBTQAI plus community locally. Since 2019, over 20 events have been held, many with partners in this work like Reformation Lutheran Church and other churches in this area. Events have ranged initially from things like holiday Zoom happy hours um, and book discussions to now monthly Friday unwinds, which is fellowship time, the creation of safe space zones, intergenerational dialogues, ongoing discussions of common text, read, and documenta documenta documentaries, easy for me to say, viewed that highlight issues such as elder care for LGBTQ persons transitioning, how the Bible has been and continues to be used to harm LGBTQ persons, etc. And although Washington Street has been the victim of hate-based destruction of some of our banners and signs, we continue our public witness to God's inclusive love for all people. For the past two years, we have gathered information on graffiti boards at our church's booth at SC Pride. Reconciling Next Team members then reviewed those responses and have used that information to help guide our work. Two of our most important and, and most successful events have sprung from those graffiti board responses. Two years ago, when asked what the church could do to right its wrongs, participants at the festival gave us lots of good um, responses. One was, I want the church to apologize for all the hurt it has caused. That October, in conjunction with Pride Week, Washington Street held its first service of repentance and healing for the harm done to LGBTQAI plus persons by the church. At Pride this year, festival goers were asked, what is an ally to you? Tonight's event is an outgrowth of responses to that question. There are many LGBTQAI plus persons who call Washington Street their home church. And we fully recognize that our straight allies are vital to any work the church does on issues of inclusion. And it is those allies that have created a church where all feel welcomed all the time. Quite simply, without the work, support, and love of our allies, the progress that has been made here would not have happened and the church we know as Washington, Washington Street today would not exist. Thank you, allies. Tonight we recognize and thank you for your hard work. At this time, at this time I'd like to call on Reverend Tom Summers to come forward for a very special presentation. In representing the Reconciling Next Team at our Washington Street Church, I feel so honored and fortunate in being asked to present this inaugural Ally Award to our wonderful guest, Harriet Hancock.
This beautiful award is given in appreciation for all your tireless, tireless efforts for these many, many years. And I'd like to, to, to capture a lot that you've done. I only will give them about five minutes, but so that awesome. would take five months to describe your, <laughs> your, your gifts. And uh, I don't know whether you want to stand up here that long. I'm, I'm fine. I just want to say about two words. I've known this attorney for years, and I've never known a more tireless ally anywhere. When, when she discovered in 1980 that her son was gay, she has never looked back, but forward with, but looking forward with helping other LGBTQIA persons find greater civil religious and human rights. For instance, let me tell you a few things that she has done. It would take, as I said, all week to really talk about this wonderful woman. When she discovered in 1980 that her son was gay, this was over 40 years ago, she has never looked back but forward with helping other LGBT persons find greater rights. She began starting in our state the first chapter of PFLAG. That means that that's the abbreviation for parents, families, and friends of gays and lesbians. Then not, not seeing any kind of sit-down times for her, Harriet became the co-founder of PALS, P-A-L-S-S, the first grassroots organization in South Carolina to provide services for those with HIV AIDS. And she also, now catch this, she also was instrumental in organizing the first Pride March that took place in 1990 in downtown Columbia and ending up on the steps with about 2,000 people on the State House grounds. Harriet, Harriet also showed tremendous support for the religious efforts of the so-called South Carolina clergy and friends as they joined in on the annual march two years later. With the naming of the LGBTQ Center in Columbia in 2005, it then became the Harriet Hancock Community Center. Now let me tell you about this. Twelve years ago, she was invited to the White House for a reception where she was selected to meet President Barack Obama. All in all, Harriet Hancock is commonly and continuously known as the mother of pride the mother of pride in our state, dips back over, gosh, uh, this long length of time when you found out your son was gay and you haven't stopped yet. No, and I'm going to keep on going as long as I got oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It gives me great pride once again to hold up this beautiful award. This is an inaugural award that will be offered, I, I assume, hopefully, every year somehow to some ally in, in this state that means so much to all of us. Thank I'll, you I'll so stand much. And hold this okay. With, uh, and give it to you. Yeah, I know we're hard on time here, so I just want to say that I certainly appreciate this award and appreciate everything that all of you have done. I feel a kind of kinship with Washington Street United Methodist Church because I have watched as y'all have traveled this very difficult path to becoming a reconciling ministry. I applaud every one of you for what you've done. It is a hard job and I hold Washington Street United Methodist Church as an example of what can be done to everybody. Other churches could take an example from you all and thank you so very much for this award. Thank you, Tom, for that presentation, and congratulations, Harriet. You're our, one of our um, stars in South Carolina. 
There's another person here who carries in his heart a commitment to those who know the pain of social prejudice and oppression and has spent his life working to remove that pain. Reverend Tom Summers, who you just heard speak, has spent over three decades <laughs> as a mental health chaplaincy director and clinical pastoral education teacher at the South Carolina Department of Mental Health. Come on up, Tom, if you'd like to send a beer while we talk about you. <laughs> I know you're going to pull this on. <laughs> So um, Tom's concern for the LGBTQ plus community grew. I mean, he's always had that concern and that love in his heart for, as I said, these people who are uh, struggling and oppressed. His concern for the um, LGBTQ community grew in 1972 when the incompatibility clause was codified into the social principles of the United Methodist Church. This action increased Tom's commitment to become a more vocal and visible LGBTQ ally. In his own words, Tom, Tom recalls an event that impacted him greatly. And I'm going to quote his work from Sheila Morris's 2018 book, Southern Perspectives on the Queer Movement. Tom wrote a chapter um, entitled Walking, the, um, Walking for the Wounded. And these are Tom's words. What became a tipping point that moved my soul toward taking a more en encompassing action on behalf of the LGBTQ persons took place while conducting a funeral in 1989. I'd been invited by a social worker in another state agency to officiate at a worship service in Columbia to honor a young gay man who had died from AIDS. Mentioned to me were a few details about the man's life. Both his family and his church had long rejected him because he was gay. As I led this service at a funeral home, there was present a small number of gay friends and pallbearers. The loneliness of the occasion was accentuated by the absence of both family and church representatives. My sense of what this man must have experienced by such rejection and betrayal in his life was gut-wrenching. After the burial service in at Columbia Cemetery, I lingered and talked with the pallbearers. One of them said to me as he walked back to my car, I want you to know how much I appreciated your saying that if you had known my friend, you would have really liked him. For me, that was the first word of love and acceptance that I'd ever heard or gotten from anyone associated with the church. Since that clarion call in the cemetery, I've never looked back, instead moving forward. When the second annual South Carolina Gay Pride March was held in 1991, I joined nearly 2,000 marchers as they strode down Main Street in Columbia toward the State House. Subsequently, I had a letter to the editor published in the ne in next month's South Carolina United Met Methodist Advocate. The letter described my participation in the march, and it pointed out that nowhere to be seen was any mobilized religious support for the cause of the homosexual community. I ended by asserting that should neither interest nor action be sown by the church, it, and I quote Tom here, assuredly will be left on the sidelines as gays and lesbians gain their God-given rights and human aspirations. Tom points to two other events that have highlighted his time as an ally. First, the historic day in October 2014, when news came down that marriage equality was going to be a thing in the United States. Tom recalls an energetic rally that he and many others participated in on the State House grounds where he and, and others um, proudly held their South Carolina friends, um, South Carolina clergy and friends, the Gays and Lesbians banner um, at that event. That was the same banner that that group of clergy and friends had been carrying since 1992 in South Carolina Pride Marches annually. Another fond memory was a supportive action Tom received from Bishop Joseph Bethay, the presiding bishop of the South Carolina Annual Conference in the early 90s. Around this time, several of Tom's writings on LGBTQ equality were being published. One writing published in the state newspaper in 1992 entitled Minister Hopes to Free Pastoral Care from the Closet was denounced by conservative readers and requests were made to the bishop to remove Tom's ordination as a United Methodist minister. Bishop Bethay was an African-American and knew well the pain of discrimination and prejudice. 
Tom recalls the bishop would always send him copies of his responses to those negative contacts, and that the bishop's wording always was consistent with an emphasis on Tom's pastoral duties that included ministry to all people, all in capital letters. When asked how has being an ally impacted him, Tom notes that he has learned much about the depths of human courage of those facing hostile threats and uncertainties. He has learned over time how to deal with anger expressed by others more gracefully, particularly those expressing religious-based anger. And he has learned how social change for the common good is indeed a long and ragged process. For his decades of long work on issues of LGBTQAI plus equality and justice, Washington Street United Methodist is proud to present Reverend Tom Summers with the Han Harriet Hancock Ally Award for 2023. <laughs> But we have another act that's going to be just as good, and I have to send my love to both. I have to send my love to both uh, Harriet and Tom, and uh, powerful statements both of those have made. And so glad we could honor them. I have the honor of introducing our key, our speakers tonight, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Nancy Malcolm and Dr. A.J. Ramirez. Um, about two months ago, when we started planning this event, we were thinking about bringing in some an uh, outside speaker, and I happened to read an article in the Reconciling Ministries update, sociologist, and make sure I get it right, um, sociologists find LGBTQ United Methodist allies stay in UMC out of hope. And that brought me hope and thought, well, you know, it might be neat to have them here, and the article really highlighted both of them as individuals, their personal stories, as well as some of their, um, some of the research that they actually started in 20, 2019 after the general conference. To, add, to answer the question, why do LGBTQ people and allies stay in a church with the harmful language and the punitive um, against ordained ministers as well as same-sex marriage? Dr. Malcolm is a professor and sociologist at Georgia Southern University. Um, her um, academic interest and research focuses on gender, childhood, and sports. She's an active member of Pittman Park UMC in Statesboro. Dr. A.J. Ramirez is a professor at of sociology at Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. She coordinates the uh, coordinator of women's and gender studies and is also a sociology faculty member. Her academic interest includes sexism, LGBTQ issues, and education reform. She is also a licensed professional counselor and on, when she's not teaching, I guess on the side, she does counseling. <laughs> What? It's, my side hustle. it's her side hustle. Um, <laughs> she, and the interesting thing about her that I think she's going to talk a little bit about, she's a lay leader of Centenary UMC in Macon, Georgia, and leads an outreach rec reconciling UMC community in Valdosta for displaced Methodists and others who need an affirming place to worship God. Dr. Malcolm is going to open, and she's going to share quotes from some of the interviews that they did during the research and talk a little bit about their stories. And Dr. Ramirez will follow, and she's going to kind of tell her own personal story of trying to find an affirming place to worship in the southeastern, southwestern part of Georgia. So welcome. It's 
I have to decide which hand is going to hold which device. And I don't like being tethered too much to the lectern, but I promise not to wander too much either. Thank you so much for inviting us to speak. This is really a, a great opportunity for AJ and for me to uh, talk to others about the research that we've been doing. It's, it's nice to get it disseminated and to share information that we've been discovering. Um, so we are both sociologists, um, but we met through the Reconciling Ministries Network. And I'll sh share a little bit. Some of you know this, um, but most of you, I'm sure, don't. Tonight is our first time to meet in person. We've, we've been meeting over, over Zoom and planning research over Zoom and emailing back and forth and dropping things into Google Docs. But here we, we're real, both of us. Um, so we wanted to talk to you about some of the research that we've been doing that started with the Qualtrics online survey that, that received um, well over 1,000 responses distributed from Reconciling Ministries Network to their members. And then some follow-up interviews that have gone beyond 100 people that we interviewed. So um, 2019, of course, started it off, right? And I think probably everybody in this room has some memory of the 2019 General Conference, which was terribly discouraging and, and frustrating and just kind of left us, I don't know, feeling like we got punched in the gut. Um, and then you might also remember J.J. Warren, the inspiration. I mean, things were really at their worst, and he strides up to the mic and essentially says, despite the traditional plan having passed, he says, I'm, I'm a college student who's gay and going into ministry, and I want to be a United Methodist minister, and I want to be the church, and we are the church, and we need to be the church together. Um, I always feel like when I look at this picture, I need to share with you. Like I've talked with, AJ about, or with J.J. about this. Um, He's, he's unhappy that he looks so angry in this picture. <laughs> it is, it is, I, I searched the, the internet for any other, he's right, this is the picture that's out there. It's the best, clearest photo, but he's, he looks very angry. Uh, he, he doesn't feel that way himself. He's, he's pretty inspiring. Uh, but, but, you know, it started off with, with his providing this inspiration. I, at the time, after General Conference, was noticing how many people were saying, well, maybe I need to leave. I thought we could do this. I thought we could become an, an open and affirming church, but I don't know if I can remain in the UMC. Uh, and so that was the question of our research. For many people, they said, if JJ stays, I'm, I'm going to stay also. But our research was investigating even more why people were making the decisions that they were making. So we ended up talking with, uh, as I said, more than 100 individuals. And I've picked up just a few, I won't share all 100 with you tonight, but just a few quotes and some of our main findings. Oh, look at me, the fancy yeah, stuff. Uh-oh. I was trying to get this stuff to go. Yeah, it's causing problems already. <laughs> so I want to talk first about Mary from North Alabama. Um, I point out a lay person, 72 years old. Um, many of our interviewees skewed older, as does the Methodist Church, but uh, and interviewees who are happy to talk to us are retired. It was harder to track down some of those working age folks who just didn't have the time. So you'll see a variety of ages, but, but skewing older. Um, you can see the quote, my father was superintendent of schools in South Alabama. He had to integrate the schools. I was home when Governor George Wallace called the house. I mean, I, I was ready to listen when she opened with that story, right? She and her family attended the Baptist church in town. And uh, her father was believing that they needed to go ahead and integrate the schools. That, that was the right thing to do. The federal laws had said, you need to do this. George Wallace called, and, and she could overhear on the phone as, as he was talking with her father. Uh, You're not going to do it. And her father says, yes, we will. You're not going to do what the feds tell you. Yes, we will. And so in their town, they integrated the schools. Um, she talked about her, her family returning to the Baptist church where the preacher was preaching against them and her father sitting straight up in the pew, eyes straight ahead, jaw set, and just taking it, but just stubbornly sitting there and taking it um, and not being swayed despite the whole town, it seemed, turning against them. Except that uh, Mary joined the Methodist Church because they, they were supporting her father in integration. And at, at the age of, you know, I think it was 15 or so, she found a home in the United Methodist Church. But this, obviously this story stuck with her and was this important example of 
doing the right thing, openly disobeying the, the law, the, the norm of the land. And she talked about the inspiration that that gave her then as, I mean, she's a reconciling Methodist who in Alabama is standing up for, um, you know, trying to make her space more affirming also. So the importance of role models really s stands out to me here. Um, Henry, 91 years old, w wonderful to interview with him. And I want to make it clear, Henry, in Texas, um, he carried the Open Hearts banner through the sanctuary on Mission Sunday. To, it was Tom? I was going to remember. Car carried a banner, too. I, that, that stuck out to me. Oh, mainly because, um, I'll tell you, just about everybody I interviewed, I asked, do you consider yourself an activist? And um, some said, absolutely, definitely. A lot of them said, yes, but I don't carry a banner. And it just tickled me how I could fill a whole page full of quotes of people saying, yes, I'm an activist, but I don't carry the banner. And, and Henry says, I carried the banner, as did Tom. So, but, you know, that's, it, that just seemed to be something important about that. Now, I want to be clear, Henry had a long life of activism, and carrying the banner was not the only thing he did. But that one stuck out. The other interesting thing about that story, now, he would have been actually in his 70s, I think, when he carried the banner on the sanctuary, through the sanctuary. He had adult children, but it got back to him that somebody in the congregation had asked, are Henry's kids gay? And, uh, you know, the, the person they asked said, well, you'll have to ask Henry. <laughs> but, the, but the story got back to him. He said, nobody ever asked me. They weren't, they weren't brave enough to come ask me. He told his kids, you know, just as a warning, I did this thing, and they were asking if you're gay. None of them were. Um, and they were proud of him, right? They said, oh, no worries, Dad. You know, that's great. We love it. You know, but he's, people might think you're gay. Um, to me, the, the modeling courage for his children, even, and how proud his children were of him and, and his activism. Um, so we've got Henry. And then Linda, who worked as a, a hospital chaplain for most of her career. So Methodist clergy person, but working in hospitals and especially through the 80s and the AIDS ep epidemic. And, and as we all know, I think you know, that that time period and the AIDS epidemic shaped a lot of people's understandings of our relationships to each other. Um, so as you can tell, th those early days and the AIDS epidemic were just horrific. In fact, I have a handful of interviews with chaplains who all said these same things, how, how those experiences in the 80s in hospitals shaped their theology. Um, but it turns out then that, that Linda, um, she worked as a chaplain. She also did a lot of outreach and was invited to, to talk to communities. And um, her, her job, she thought, was to help explain and dispel fear, right? She, she said, this, this stuck out to me, that their sons were coming home to die because they had no place to go. I mean, she was talking to a lot of rural communities, their sons had left and gone to a big city somewhere, but were coming home to die. And you know, not all we know were able to go to their homes, but in this case, she knew of many who were, and was talking to communities and saying, um, trying to teach them, it doesn't matter how they got it. The fact is they're here, they're sick, they need our love and concern. Um, so just the ministry that she did, not just in the hospital, but in the communities, in, in trying to help spread understanding and that message of love. Uh, and then we've got Ruth in, in Florida. <laughs> so I, I, you're la the thing is, it's not going where you think it's going. Her church is very close to the Poles nightclub shooting and served as a meetup point after the fact. And, uh, and many of the members are first responders, worked in the hospital. Uh, the first responders saw firsthand what had happened. The parking lot in their church you know, saw firsthand um, as, as family and friends were gathering, at least try, you know, trying to reconnect. Um, ER doctors in their congregation said, we were ready, but nobody came. Um, and she said that that just changed their church. I mean, just just changed them. 
uh, and shaped. <laughs> My church just changed shape. And she went on to say, we had a gay wedding, very openly in defiance, and we didn't care. And it was a beautiful wedding. It was the gala of the century. <laughs> um, right? This is after the shooting. And they had a longtime gay member, but the, you know, partner, but they'd not been married to this point. You know, laws are, are still changing. And um, the man had approached the pastor and said, we want to have a ceremony. Will, will you, you know, can we do this? And he wanted to have it in, the, in a backyard. The, the gay member of the church wanted to have it in a backyard. And the pastor said, no, you're going to have it in the sanctuary. And so they, they did. She says, um, no invitations went out. 300 plus people showed up. <laughs> and, and she said, members of my Sunday school class who I thought would be opposed, they were there. And within weeks afterwards, our Sunday school class became a reconciling community. And just the rallying, you know, again, another story that, that sticks with me. I, I can go ahead and share that for many of these interviews, I cried along with the interviewees. Um, this is one. We were, we were both, you know, tearing up quite a bit, but an amazing story. Um, Joan? In Rio, Texas, I don't actually have too much beyond, you know, the, the quotes here, but, but for her story, the quotes are important for allies, I think. For, for straight allies, um, she, she told me, if we're staying, we have to stay and be in the struggle to change. To try and make changes and not just have conversations about it. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing both, don't be silent, but don't just have conversations. Uh, beyond that, she had said, some of our congregants that are queer have said, I'm going to be involved in the church in all other kinds of ways, but I'm not going to be in these meetings, like in post-2019, where we talk about whether we, we should include me. Right? And so, I mean, straight allies need to be, she was saying, the ones shouldering that burden and being on the committees and leading the conversations and making sure that the conversations go beyond talking. Uh, but that was a really special, keen insight, I think, of, of the role of allies. Um, finally, Eric, on the journey to affirmation from North Alabama, a clergy person, active clergy. And he, he says it was really ministry that changed my mind. I mean. He didn't start off open and affirming. Uh, but in his first ministerial position, he had several gay parishioners. One came to him and, and privately shared a story of a lifetime of, um, of not fitting in, of, of his own homophobia, of self-hate, and self-mutilation that, that led nearly to his death. And uh, so Eric is recounting how he, you know, is, has a parishioner sharing this story with me. He says, I'm, I'm listening and thinking my theology is not sufficient. I cried with them. I prayed. We prayed. I prayed for God to show me what I need to know. And he, he wasn't ready for that. But he was listening and open to, to hearing and then, you know, thinking of, of the next step. Um, my devotional, he says, for that day, like that, the next day, I think, my, my devotional for the day was Matthew 23. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. And he says, in that moment, after hearing this young man's story, um, he realized that it was his job, Eric's job, to help lift burdens, not to make them any heavier, right? So that, that realization through ministry, um, he, he, he went on to, to do um, church plants that were intentionally uh, farming, in fact, made up primarily of LGBTQ plus individuals. He started off with some flag groups. He has Bible studies for um, black gay men. I mean, he's now very active in Alabama in pushing an open and affirming church. And, and then after describing all of this, the experiences in his ministry that shaped him, that led him to take those actions, he said, and then uh, after the fact, after doing this for 20 years, my son came out to us a couple months ago. I thought I'd been doing this for other people. I was just doing it for us. 
And um, I, to wrap it up, as I pass off the microphone to AJ, um, you know, we, we, some, we sometimes know our audience. We've got a visible audience, people who are watching us, listening to us, seeing what we're doing. But then there are other people who notice that, that I think we don't realize, oh, we're reaching them too. Uh, and sometimes those people are really close. So I, again, I want to thank you for having us, letting us uh, share and, and talk with you about just the tip of the iceberg of the research we've been doing. Um, but I, if I push next, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. it's AJ. You know, I sit there and listen to Nancy. I'm AJ uh, Ramirez. But as I sit there and listen to Nancy as you go over that, I sit there and go, hmm, oh, Jesus, oh, my God. You know, I'm just I'm feeling it all over again, even though you read this, to hear it presented uh, from another human being. Um, it, it really hits home. And it also hits home because, you know, many of us in this room, whether we identify with the, with the community ourselves first, you know, we have a family member, we're there. You know, we're there. So this becomes more than a search for us. This becomes a living moment and experience. And it becomes something for me that I'm communing with in my spirit with these people. So this this research has been very personal for me um, as, as a Christian and as a member of the United Methodist Church. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Valdosta. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember that tag. Uh, I am not from Valdosta. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, it is south. It's a southern part of the state like Dallas, but it's quite different. <laughs> I, I often tell folks, you know, if you go to San Antonio, uh, you'll get great, great text next to you. You'll get a wonderful walk on the river walk, great dancing, and a wonderful environment to make love to the person you love. It's just that environment. So, Is that better? Yeah, it's, it's picking up this with the little black thing. Okay, so it, but this is okay? This is not okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay, so <clears throat> we're, when, I'm, when I think about Valdosta, Georgia, number one, I, I, you know, this is everywhere, but this is how me and my wife have felt for probably the last... 15 years and living in Valdosta, that's how long we've been there, about 16 years. Uh, alone, uh, struggling uh, to find home, to find acceptance. Uh, and it's not just us. It's just, in my classes, you know, I'm walking back and forth, right? Uh, in my classes, I'm uh, walking back and forth. The, 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 the sad part about this is we probably did church hopping for a long time. Um, and finally, you know, went back to the Methodist Church just because some of the other places there, the only really affirming place in Valdosta was two Episcopal churches. And don't get me wrong, I love the Episcopalians. They're wonderful. They use real wine. <laughs> <for the union. laughs> um, and, and, and they're just amazing. Very hospital, very loving people. But, you know, Methodist was home. You know, that was home. And, um, and so, yeah. We went through a series of different churches, and it was difficult. And, and as I'm teaching at the university, right, and I'm, I'm, I'm not just teaching, I also have my private practice, so I'm doing psychotherapy, and I'm hearing stories from students, specifically young folks in our communities, that are just giving up on God, you know? And, and not because they're giving up on God because they feel like God has given up on them, but because they don't have community to be able to fellowship and grow in that relationship with God. And uh, it was heartbreaking. And I'm sitting here, obviously, as a psychotherapist in my office, I can't really discuss anything about God with them in that sense. But in the classroom, I'm also hearing this sense of, Dr. Ramirez, you know, I, you cannot be gay and be a Christian in the South. It's just, it's just not going to work. And, and they were just pulled between this. The gay community would pull them away from, from Christianity, right, because of the wounds and the hurt and the trauma, and I get that. And then the church was pulling them away from their gay community because that was an abomination. <laughs> you could inherit the kingdom of God that way. So, um, so they were, this, is, this became just like 
a great photo, just a great picture to just kind of embrace of the feeling of the, I would call it the desolation or the famine or, I don't know, the Valley of Dry Bones is, is South Georgia. Um, so I did this. I wanted to kind of show you our, our reconciling abundancy. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've got, does this have a little red dot? Okay, she's a little, yep. So there's Savannah, that's Trinity, and uh, Asbury, I think maybe. I think they've disaffiliated, but still, we got two over there. Well, and then Nancy just informed me that Pittman Park is only a Sunday school, so he connects that one off, it's not a church. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I feel like it should count because it's something. We ain't even got that down here. And then this is Macon, this is my, my church. Uh, that has opened up their arms, Centenary United Methodist Church, which is also an older church, uh, not quite as old as Washington Street, but old in itself in the 1850s. Um, and uh, they have accepted me and my wife and my son's membership. So we drive, go to church, we drive about two hours and 15 minutes, one Sunday a month or every six weeks to have community and fellowship with our own church. And then uh, my, we have been kind of commissioned, as my military school first sergeant would say, uh, down here back to our home to start a reconciling community, which has been, which has been a challenge. But, but my point is, is that this is why I'm seeing the, the, the floodgates open of the desolation of that photo you saw here. I mean, this is, this is bad. I mean, this is bad. I mean, this is, there's nothing. There's nothing, none of these, and this is all the rural counties of South Georgia. And when I say rural, I mean some of these, like let's see, you go over here. This is Cook County right here. It's like you go into Sparks, Georgia, there's only like one traffic light in the Dollar General. I mean, these are like really small, small communities. And um, and so there's a there's been this great need. So when I was doing this research, when Nancy actually reached out to me a few years ago and says, AJ, you want, you want to do this with me? Yeah, I think this is a great idea. Let's do it. This really hit home because I'm like, yeah, what? Why am I staying in the Methodist Church? I mean, I've got no support. And if it wasn't for this gentleman by the name of, uh, I don't know if his name is Tim Bagwell, Reverend Tim Bagwell. Uh, he was the uh, the senior pastor of this church. He is now since retired. But I was on a call at a, with a reconciling group on a Zoom meeting during uh, right, right probably right when COVID was about to start, probably early 2020. And he is the reason uh, that we were able to get our membership up there at Centenary. He reached out. I was literally about to throw him in the towel. I was like, man, I think enough is enough. I've been doing this long enough. I wasn't about to throw the towel in on God, just the Methodist church. I was like, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to drink real wine or something like that and become an Episcopalian. Uh, because it was just, it's just there's no community. And, you know, we're, we're prone. We like this to get together sitting at our little round tables with our, our sweet tea and what's on sweet tea? Dirty water. And we're all together and having a good time. But this is important. This is important. So um, just, just to kind of let you know, Macon, Georgia reached out to us and God bless them. I, I love them a lot for, for what they're doing and for supporting us financially and supporting us with their prayers and um, coming down. The senior pastor, Sarah P. Montgomery, will come down. Uh, and do communion for us, and she will, you know, preach. And, you know, we meet the second Sundays, the second Sundays of every month. Uh, uh, an Episcopal church has opened up sanctuary for us. This is actually the church we use. We put up a little sign right outside the doors of the Episcopal church, and at 5 o'clock on second Sundays, that's us. This is the only reconciling worship service below that line <laughs> that we know of in, in South Georgia. Um, so I say all of this because what you have here is beautiful. I, I was taking pictures of all the neat stuff y'all got, the, the flyers. I went inside your beautiful sanctuary and I saw all those cute little visitor with the rainbow doors on the bottom. I'm like, oh my God. I'm sending the cry emoji to my pastor. Oh my God, it's on every single pew, right? Your identity statement with the pretty frame. I'm like, oh my God, I'm taking pictures of that. I'm sending it. Um, and I understand that you're only one of two, right? 
in the whole state. And I know I'm thinking I'm getting like this very skewed, right? This perception of South Carolina. I'm gonna go back and say, South Carolina's got it together, guys. <laughs> Georgia doesn't. But then if you go to North Georgia, there's a lot of reconciling communities up here in Atlanta. Um, I mean, if you go above that line, if I had put the dots above it, it would have been a, a bunch of them. But uh, I say I say a, a lot of this because this connects to the passion of, of, the, of the research that, that we, we conducted together and that we're still kind of exploring and learning as we read through this stuff and as we engage with you guys and we learn more about not just the experience of those that we, we, we spoke to through this process, but also as we engage as, with, with you guys saying, hey, I read the article and I'm intrigued. This is interesting. Why are people staying? And, and I think in some ways, as a personal note, when you make a connection in a way that speaks to you, for example, the open hearts, the open minds, the open doors, the ideas of Wesley and, and this, this, rip, this foundation that works of going forward with progress, progressiveness towards the good of mankind and that engagement with God, you don't want to lose that. And, and, I, and I think when we see the struggle, at least when I do, with students or, or my neighbors who are struggling with this similar, you know, I, I don't know, AJ, if I can go forward with this anymore. I don't know if I can do this. I'm asking, okay, so what, what, if, what if you could do it? What if there was a path? What if there was hope and you could do it? Would you stick with it? Well, yes, I would stick with it, but I don't feel like I have any support. I think the more support we can get, and that's what I'm kind of hoping that this one little teeny dot in Valdosta, Georgia will make a little bit of a spark so that some of these other communities around us will say, we can do this too. Um, I think though, kind of looking at places like this in Columbia is a great testimony to folks like us um, out in the sticks to say that it is possible. It is possible, and if we have this many people saying that they have hope in the church and they're going to go forward with it, you know, I think there's a hope for a lot of the young folks in uh, these communities who are struggling and, and unfortunately ending in unfortunate situations like suicide and things like that. Um, so I'm open to like questions or comments if anybody's got any. I can do it in Espanol, you know, we can do it in Spanish too. Todos está bien, preguntas, preguntas. Yeah. Um, thank you, it's very informational. I was going to ask, I guess, thinking about rural America, how physically did you attract people to your reconciling congregation? Like in a community like that, did you put up flyers, what does this say? This is like, this is available to you. I'm curious like, how you can recruit people. So, true story, we're, we're a pretty small group. We're a group of like maybe 15 right now. We, we've grown to about 22 in the last two months because of all the disaffiliations that have happened. Um, there was 11 United Methodist churches in Lowndes County, which is what the red dot is, um, and 10 disaffiliated. So there's only one left, and they're not reconciling. Um, I asked him if they would just go ahead and be reconciling, and he was like, you know, AJ, I admire what you're doing. <laughs> So thanks, Jerry. He says, I don't think my congregation's ready for that yet, but I admire you. <laughs> He's a nice guy, but I, like, I got it. You're just, I get it. That's fine. So the, the, as far as the marketing piece or the attraction piece, it's really, we're kind of in the process of doing that. And just those other Sundays that we don't meet, it's kind of like our mission job to go out there and to be the church beyond the walls, because we really don't have walls. I mean, we pay rent for one Sunday. Um, so it's almost kind of like, a, you know, that's kind of our church when we're not there. Um, and that's how we make the connections and say, well, do you want to come and join us that second Sunday? If not, we can just make sandwiches or do what it is we're doing. So that's been our process so far. With the disaffiliation of the other churches now, we have got some visitors who have joined us from the big, like the big First United Methodist churches and the kind of the cornerstone churches that have disaffiliated, they, they have joined us and we're having a conversation about it. And we usually meet at Mellow Mushroom over beer and pizza. <laughs> it's a good spot. Good question, anybody else? If anybody has questions for either speaker, please raise your hand. So AJ, I've got a question. 
Yeah. Uh, other than the obvious praying for you and your group and your ministry, how could a church like Washington Street support you, you know, in rural southern Georgia and what you're doing? Wow, Jim, that's a good one. Well, I mean, prayer is number one. I mean, I'm a firm believer in prayer, but I don't know how, do you guys reach out, uh, or do y'all have, do you know of areas in the rural South Carolina area that would be interested in any, any of this kind of stuff? I mean, I'm sure there is. Maybe they're just kind of all kind of scattered. Um, not sure. I mean, as far as support for us, it's just, I guess, just staying in contact and encouraging one another on social media, wherever it is that connects the folks who would be utilizing those access points. Um, I know things like technology speak very loudly to many youth in the LGBTQ community. Um, I'm a member of the Pride Connection at the university and we have an app for everything. And I'm like, okay guys, you're gonna have to help me with this because I'm old. And uh, I know, I am. I, I hit 41 this year. Yeah. I'm, hit, I'm, hit, I'm getting up there. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I got to go to the doctor twice and I'm going to get mixed up once. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I mean, I'll, let me think on that a little bit more because that's a great question. I'm not used to folks saying, hey, how can we support you? I'm used to, I admire you, AJ. <laughs> so, thanks, Jim. I, I'll, I'll send you an email. <laughs> After, we'll meet at the Mellow Machine and I'll, I'll let you know. Well, I'll be available anyway afterwards. I was just trying to kill more time. But I appreciate y'all listening. And if you have more questions, me and or Nancy will be able to answer those for you. So thanks. We do have more time if anyone who wants questions, have questions and answers or questions. Or any thoughts that you may have heard that, that resonated with you. Yes. How do you reconcile church, Methodist Church in South Carolina? Two. Two. Really? Where's Columbia. St. <laughs> Mark's. St. Mark's. St. Mark's. <laughs> and we're over a hundred members of this tiny little church, and we're going through this mess right now. But um, I'm confident that we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's just so hard. Okay. In your research, did you or did you look to how this? Subject is affecting middle school, high school. We kind of know what's going on in colleges, but how is this affecting 
the middle school, if you know, the middle school and the high school. And sometimes the elementary. But the middle school and the high schools are the ones who are being impacted by all of this, whether they're in church or not. So the the social scientist in me wants to say, yeah, our, our research didn't look at that. We don't <laughs> we don't have the you know because there's only specific things that we asked and the, the people that we talked to had to all be adults and yeah. Um, but wow, I mean, of course it you know like the culture is reaching. I mean, the ideas, the ideologies, the beliefs, it's it's there. Um, and now all of a sudden, I've got like all these things I think I want to weave together. Um, I was talking to AJ earlier, and then your comments about, you know, there's a lot more supportive people out there than we realize. Um, maybe everywhere, but especially in the Deep South, we're just quiet. Especially if you're an open and affirming Christian. <laughs> you're quiet about it. Um, so, you know, like what, Pittman Park, should we be a dot on that map or not? We are not a reconciling congregation. We're a very mixed Congregation, but there's a lot of affirming people there who I think are even, you know, quietly so, um, it, including, you know, like, so our youth group, believe me, they're open and affirming because they're out to each other. The, you know, the, those who identify as not straight are out, and their youth director and their friends, and they, they all know, and the pastor knows, but, but, you know, not everybody in the congregation needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's an affirming space, and it's really important. They are tight knit and cohesive. I think because it's needed, and certainly plenty of people that I spoke with during the interviews talked about. One of the questions I asked was, "What are your fears for the church? I mean, the future? Because if if the United Methodist Church can't get itself to be affirming." as a denomination soon, it does not have a future. Just de just demographics, I think, you know. This question may not come from you, but um, or anybody else. I used to be a Methodist for years, and I left it because I felt like I was in the middle of it. I felt like the blood of God. Uh, my husband died. Uh, he was a Methodist minister. He said, when this happens, the church is going to pull apart. And I kept saying, no, they're Presbyterians, they're you know, all these people have gone before you, so it won't matter. And said, no, it will matter. Um, so it's been really frustrating for me. And AJ, JJ Warren has been like, you know. But my question is this if as a congregation you don't vote to leave the Methodist Church, to me, that means you're an affirming church. No. I know, well, I know, I know you're saying that that's not the case. But in my simple mind, that means you are affirming. The rights of people. So I don't understand why this. I mean, I, I, know, I know that they're not naive, but how, how can we? Can, can I say something about it? Because I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but the way that we are going to keep Lessons and I the Church together, and the, what we have presented to our church council and to everybody is that. You know, a lot of us have been sticking this out for years. We're the Methodists. That's who we are. And we're asking other people to stick it out and just understand that a lot of these rumors that have been going around that the Methodist Church has gone off the rails and we're going to start disavowing the divinity of Christ and the resurrection and the Trinity is all a load of bull. And it just got started and it's been, and that's the kind of thing that we want to say, look, it's okay if you are not affirming. Don't disenfranchise me. Don't mar marginalize me because I am. And I'm not going to marginalize you because you are not. We can still sit together in the pews and we can still sing the same hymns and, and follow the same uh, liturgy as we always have. But you all are going to have to be prepared that there's a possibility there's going to be a gay wedding in this church. And you don't have to go to it if you don't want to. To me, the word affirming means your preacher gets up there and he says, he or she says, um, please play, pray with me and for me. You're praying for your preacher to, you're affirming that he is going to, or she is going to present something that is um, Christ-like, that is going to, and God is going to be speaking for him. You've affirmed him. Well, 
If somebody can't affirm a gay pastor and they get one, they're probably not going to stay. But if there's a gay wedding, you don't have to go to the gay wedding. You don't have to get up there and bless that union if you'll just stick with us. And then maybe eventually people will come and come and come around. But I don't see that just because you stay in Methodist as you are going to be an affirming church. This is the other, the other story that I had to weave into it. Um, is that when we started publishing, now, so our research is, this is like drinking from a fire hose at this point, like we have just wrapped it up and we've got all of this data and we're trying to get some of it out, but tip of the iceberg and like, wow, there's so much else there. But w when we um, started getting some of that out in UM Insight and through Reconciled Ministries Network, and that's how y'all found us, right? And uh, Cynthia Astle, the, Astle the, the editor of United Methodist Insight then wanted to interview the two of us and she published a piece about the research that we're doing, so published our research and then about our research. And so in that interview, she had, um, I, well, I mean, I, I shared that several years ago, our, my son came out as, as gay. He's been gay his whole life, I knew that. But, you know, he came out and, uh, and, and that was cool. And he's, you know, actively involved in our church. And I said, in 2019, after the general conference, my spouse and I asked him, he's a high schooler at that point, um, do you want to stay in this church? If you want to leave the Methodist church, we will go to a different church. We do not have to stay here. He's, but he was, uh, he, he wanted, he made the decision. He wanted to stay. That was, that was his group. He felt comfortable there. He, for a year, worked as church steward. And, you know, he had lots of support and friendships. Um, and I told Cynthia in the interview that, um, that he felt loved and supported by our church. And Cynthia had promised that we would see the final piece, the final draft, before it was published. And she included that story. And so I wanted to run that by my son before it was published nationally. <laughs> and he would say, yeah, that's fine. Except, except this, this one part. Um, I felt loved and supported by individuals in the church. I did not feel loved and supported by the church. Because the church is, is this institution that did not have, uh, it has language about incompatibility and, and rules about marriage and ordination. So he absolutely, you know, he, he didn't see even the, just the, the local congregation. He, he, he wanted to be clear that that was individuals, not the church. So I would, I, I mean, I, I stay in my church, but I hope we aspire to more than just being individuals who love my children. Would, if I may real quick, let me touch on that since you said family. We, me and my wife, have a, we have four children, but our youngest is four. And um, we don't want our son raised. This is why we have went out on a limb to, to do this outreach in Valdosta. We don't want our son raised in a church with just a few people saying it's okay that you have two moms, right? Um, we want him to be raised learning about Christ and his love and his compassion. I mean, all of those great things and not the culture wars and all of this nonsense. Our three older children will not go to church now because of that, because they were given these messages that there's something wrong with your, with your family. It's not your fault. You're innocent. But your moms, you know, they're living in sin. Um, so, so the Methodist church that we were prior to Centenary, one of them, would not allow me and my wife to be on the communion team. We could not, we could not hold the cup. Uh, we could not, uh, we couldn't do anything leadership. We couldn't even run a small group because it was considered a ministry leadership position and we were homosexual. So we just don't, but we were welcomed, yes. They would take our tithe and allow us to sit in the pews and you know, volunteer as much as we wanted at any of the other events. But, um, but yes, that, that was problematic for us. And, and, and we learned later that our children, at the time were in middle school and high school, when they became uh, college age, they, they, they disclosed this to us and we, we didn't know. They were trying to protect their parents. So sad. I know. It breaks my heart. Not this time. The four-year-old's not going to experience that. <laughs> Someone else had their hand up. Yeah. Now, I came to North Carolina in 1982 to go to Bible college. And 
go to graduate school in Carolina. The other reason that I came is that I was fleeing a church that had no idea how to reconcile being a faithful person and being gay. So I had to leave that environment. But I still didn't solve the problem. Intellectually, I couldn't reconcile being a person of faith while at the same time I had these feelings. So here's how I resolved it. I quit coming to church. That was 40 years ago. When working with students in Captain Valgasta, who've been raised in the South, who probably were in the same environment I was in, they were taught that this is wicked. It's whatever the Old Testament said about it. But the church is not allowing them to become a part of their worship. They rejected them. So how do you counsel those students or those young people that come to you and ask you how they can reconcile the two? If you can tell me that, I might start coming more. <laughs> Oh, that's a loaded that that is that's a, but it's a great question and I mean it is the question I think I think it's an it's an involvement like it's a series of getting together with that individual with that student and processing and 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 for me at least when I do therapy I'm learning just as much as they are taking the intervention I'm learning about their lives because they are the expert of their own lives in that situation and so for me that, that question would, would be me building a relationship with that student and learning more about who they are, what they want, right? How do they see themselves now versus where they want to see themselves? And then seeing if that's possible in the area we live in. And if not, then we talk about options. I mean, you're, I think you're asking the question of all, of, all LGBTQ, not just youth, but adults as well. Um, we have folks in our community who want to be a part of the reconciling group that we have, but won't because they are business people or have, you know, businesses in the community or positions in the community that may be compromised if they were outed. Or because being seen, here's another thing, there's a stigma. If you're at a reconciling group, then perhaps you are gay or perhaps you're trans or perhaps you're supportive of such things or your child there becomes this kind of well why are you there why do you need to be there there's all these other options and so we're not just dealing with the layer of those who need it who are part of the LGBT community but we're also dealing with the stigma of those who may want to be supportive of it or 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 are it still closeted and don't want to be affiliated with the possible stigma of that. So there, I mean, right, so many layers to that. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna piggyback real fast just because, uh, you know, some of those slides were that overcoming fear and those fears can be real small. Like, what if they think that, you know, that, that seems small to me. Um, I forgot one of my important bullet points about the woman in Florida, you know, whose, whose church lived through the absolute worst and then held the wedding because they were no longer afraid. I mean, they had seen, they knew what real fear was. And they were like, you know, standing up to the bishop, that's nothing at that point. I mean, really, that, that really, I think, was their attitude. Um, I, might, I might have also forgotten to mention that their pastor was disciplined, but the whole church was like, Ooh, that's fine. You know, they had lived through the worst and had no reason to fear this church thing anymore. So. I wonder if in your research you found any so many folks have faith tied in with certainty or belief as over against this awesome experience that we have of God's law. That is, God can't be defined so much, so clearly. I wonder if in your research you found out that this belief that ministers hide behind and on belief, you've got to believe certain things. 
bodily resurrection. Da 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 da. So uh, I wonder if you found people expressing themselves to you about faith being certainty. You know, when I die, I'm going to straight to right. heaven. And uh, da da. Right. If I don't believe this, then that leaves me vulnerable and <coughs> over against the openness of, of uncertainty about it all. If we know within our hearts the feeling about it, what we give, what we affirm about being, that being God, but we, we, you can't describe that kind of mystery. So I, I mean, it, it's, that's a fascinating question. I, I mean, the the main question of the interviews was, you know, why do you stay? And even the the survey where we had them fill in, open ended question, why do you stay, or why did you leave? Um, many people mentioned faith as a reason to stay because of my faith. But um, I, I, I didn't investigate to that extent certainty. And nobody mentioned, I mean, even more so though, so many journeys toward affirmation, right? Which means open to changing faith or better, newer, understa newer understandings of uh, the walk of faith is, for, for so many people that I talked to was an experience. I mean, I guess that's, that's Reminded me of Wesley as <laughs> reason and tradition and experience in scripture. Powerful word in that is certainty. Yeah. Faith and certainty. But I don't I see I don't think anybody mentioned that to me at all. Trust mm -hmm. of not knowing what you necessarily can define. Trust in it all. As over against belief. Yeah. And I think clergy often in their sermons throw in a cause. I mean, yeah, that's definitely something I think to add for you know, you know, further studies. You know, um, I we I don't I don't recall that ever coming up in any of the interviews. Uh, I, I more or less folks really discussed why they stayed and the activism and any sort of how did they come to believe it. Um, how their experiences were currently, um, how were they navigating the aspects of where their church was. Sometimes the disaffiliation came up with regard to where the church was at. Um, the history of Methodism, John Wesley, kind of coming back to the foundation of, uh, this, was, this was a theme for me, and I, I was able to connect with this as well, was, was why even bother when there's other um, denominations that you know, are already affirming. And, and one thing that resonated well was because the church is wrong on this one. You know, they're wrong on the idea that we cannot affirm LGBTQ. Uh, the church has already gone through the abolition of slavery. The church went through the, the ordination of women. I mean, time and time again, we see the United, or we see the Methodists going through this, this time of, of fighting against that which is oppression. Um, and here we are again. And so that sense of we, we have to stay with that trend because that's who we are and that's why I stay. Um, leaving means that I give in and allow what the original foundation is and just let it go to junk, right? It's almost like you know, fighting for you know, what you believe in. I know it sounds kind of corny, but that's what it is. I have a question. Maybe I missed it tonight, but the uh, Methodist thing I had that bracelet. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming here again. Um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Becky Shirley. I'm the senior pastor here at Wild Hill Street. And it is such a blessing to be in this community of faith. But part of the reason we scheduled this for this time of year is because South Carolina United Methodist will be going to annual conference the first week of June. And I do not know, none of us know, um, what the temperature will be of people's emotions, um, reactions to resolutions, to churches that are separating and, leave, and leaving. Um, but I really, I agree with the statement that too often we're silent. And I really would like for all of us to encourage delegates, laity, and clergy 
when harmful words or actions, um, statements, resolutions, whatever, are made, that we not be silent, that we realize that we are not alone, um, and that we speak in love and in grace, um, but that we stand for truth and we stand for justice and not be afraid and, and, and to realize that we are not a single voice and to just give up our hands and, and to walk away, um, but to say, no, this is worth fighting for. This is worth staying together for. Because how sad it would be. I mean, it is really heartbreaking to think of how long so many people have worked so hard. And what if people had not stayed in the battle for women to be ordained? What would I do? <laughs> What if, when, what if people in this Methodist church had not stayed in the battle uh, to do away with the Central Conference to be able to bring races together? And we still have a lot of work to do there, I know. As Tom has said, the battle for justice and peace and harmony is long and it is ragged. Um, but I hope that y'all will have courage to speak to your delegates, and if you are a delegate, um, and to speak up yourself. Um, and to be aware um, of how we respond with that grace and that love. And I thank y'all so much for your research. Thank you. I, I want to say, too, that um, they said it so well, that the, one of the main purposes of this was to bring allies together so that we could thank you because in this church, as Jim said in his opening remarks, we would not be a reconciling church today if it wasn't for allies willing to stand up and speak out. And one of the, uh, one of the comments we got on the graffiti board stuck with me, that an ally is someone who speaks up even when I'm not there, when I'm not there. They'll speak up for me when I'm not there. And there are people in this church who have done that and continue to do that. And I, I just can't say enough thank you to all of you. And in my heart, I'm going to cry. <laughs> because they've all been good to me. And we have a Paul Wood who wants to talk a little bit about what uh, the Reconciling South Carolina Reconciling is going to do at uh, annual conference coming up. Exactly. Thank you. I'm Paul Wood, a retired clergyman. I'm from Camden and got smart and moved back to Camden a year and a half ago. My wife is Kay. She's a deacon. There she is, deacon in the conference. Um, I helped to organize the South Carolina Coordinating Council for Reconciling Ministries. We will have a nice presence at annual conference. You'll see a table there. There's a banner. In fact, I think that's it, and I'm to take it to Florence. You know those buttons that I have? I'm down to 21. <laughs> but I have another 475 that will be on the table at annual conference. So it's an effort, you see, to be present, to encourage these delegates, to inform these delegates. Now, you may have a couple of questions about annual conference, especially if you plan to go as a delegate. There are four resolutions. You might be aware of them. Uh, I hope that you are. They're right along our lines. They're submitted by the uh, coordinating council that I referred to. They've been ruled out of order. Okay, that just happened today. How, and that's because they come from a, not an official group of the annual conference, but from an unofficial group, Reconciling Ministries. So someone will make a motion at the beginning of annual conference to, uh, to uh, forego standing rule 70, I think it is, and allow for these resolutions to be presented. So if you're voting, please vote for, for, uh, for uh, temporarily putting aside that standing rule. Um, there's concern that there will be any number of churches leaving the annual conference. We know that. And there's concern that the delegates from those churches will still vote during annual conference. For example, they could vote against these resolutions they could theoretically vote for the budget. But that doesn't seem right, does it? Um, these churches 
that are leaving are still to be members of the annual conference, South Carolina conference, until the last day of June. So technically, these people can vote all the way through. So we hope that on grounds of conscience, these people will just forego voting, okay? The vote to allow these churches to leave will take place sometime on Tuesday of annual conference. I hope that all those delegates will then depart. Uh, that way they won't vote on the budget, et cetera. Uh, but we will see. So uh, let us pray that on grounds of conscience, these people will not participate. The Coordinating Council for Reconciling Ministries is, is all inclusive of the state. And ladies, there are at least 800 individuals on, on our email list. Um, this is really a group of people, I think, from the Midlands within reach of Columbia. Uh, these people are all over the state from St. Andrew by the Sea at Hilton Head and churches in Charleston to St. Mark in Seneca and Central in Spartanburg. It goes on and on. Uh, not every town is Greenville, okay? Not every town is Greenville, South Carolina. So there's hope for us, and I will just affirm what we've heard before, that it, as we keep witnessing, as we continue to be who we are, and to speak when possible, and vote when possible. That we're moving in the right direction with the Holy Spirit. Justice will come to pass. And a last word for Tom Summers, and maybe everybody else. I think it's Frederick Beekner who said, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> I'll close with that. Thank you. <laughs> So just a, just a few concluding remarks. First of all, um, I just want to let you know we had almost twice the people we were hoping to have for this event tonight. So thank you all for being here. On your, t on your table, you see some Summer Pride Studies events that um, Washington Street and Reformation Lutheran, Lutheran Church are co-sponsoring over the summer. Typically, we take, take time off in the summer, but the summer said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to continue our study and give people our opportunity to come together. Um, there are three different books here we'll be discussing. A couple that um, are very brief that you um, might want to read. The first one, I wouldn't say buy, is $86. We'll take care of that, and we'll, we'll lead the discussion on that one. But I hope you can join us for some of those Summer Pride studies. The other thing I want to comment on is on these buttons, Invisible Witness, I, and I harp on this a lot. There's people in this room right now who are at Washington Street because of very visible witnesses, banners and stuff that we've had outside. Um, I wear this Do No Harm button to church every Sunday, and lots of us do. And every Sunday after a church, I go to Publix to buy my whatever I'm going to eat. About 75% of the time, someone makes a positive comment about this. I've heard stories about people's trans children um, who work at Publix. I've heard just thanks for having that on and, and wearing that in, in Publix today. Um, so please go to see Paul, get the rest of these 21 buttons. There are more do no harm buttons in the foyer. So feel free to take one, wear it proudly. Um, they really do start great conversations generally. I've never had anyone comment negative to me about the button I wear. May happen, but it ha hasn't happened so far. <laughs> So um, first of all, we want to thank AJ and Nancy for being here and traveling great distance for being with us.